Thanks everyone for being here. Special thanks to Maxim for having me. This is a real honor. So my name is Ridvan Malioko and I go on the internet by plastic pistols because of obvious reasons. I'm a self-taught motion designer and 3D artist and I have been in this industry for more than 15 years. I was born and raised in a small country called Kosovo, but the last six years I've been living in New York and I work uh, with good people at Attaboy Studios. So now let's see my reel and then we dive into my presentation. I can do this all day, I can do this all night. I can do this all day, I can do this all night. All month, all year, for my whole entire life. Who you know got a home, but seen to live on the road. Looking like a black gypsy in a caravan of road. Music for the people, I used to rap on the train. Now I rap on the stage and I'm used to capital gain. I ain't asking for change, I'm good at calling the phrase. What I want is more than ever and never to fade away. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So my first talk is going to be hitting demanding deadlines from pitch to the final product. So as I said, I work at Attaboy Studios and we're relatively small studio, but we do all sorts of things. We do motion graphics, we do cell animation, 3D animation, visual effects, live action, stop motion, you name it. And actually, lately, we start digging into VR and AR. Now, as any studio out there, very often we're challenged with very short deadlines and small budgets. Now, sometimes we do have long deadlines until the client call us and be like, hey, can we get that done by tomorrow morning? <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking how Cinema 4D help us overcome these challenges. Now, a little bit of a brief about this project before we dive in. So one day our creative director came to me and he said, um, hey, man, we're trying to pitch for this project and it's really cool. And the idea was that they were these uh, miniature people building something of the real world scale. Now we were pitching for two different animations. One was with, with bakers. So these guys were coming all together to build wedding cake. So real size wedding cake. And the other one was with landscapers. So landscapers were coming together to plant a tulip, a flower. The client already had a printing campaign going with real props, but they wanted to turn this into animation. Now, the problem that they were having was that they had a small budget and they didn't have, they could not make like a stop motion piece of, for it. So our challenge was to kind of sell the idea that we can build those characters inside CG and they will look as good as the real props. Now I said to my creative director, this idea sounds really awesome and I'm very excited about this, but how much time do we have for this pitch? And it's like, well, I think we have to post tonight. So <laughs> this is some of the frames that we came that night. We made those, those frames in a day, basically. And after we present this to the client, we won the pitch. And then after that, we made those characters here. So these were the final ones. And for this, I have to credit also a good friend of mine, uh, Dennis Sharabaring, because uh, after we won the pitch, he made those characters, but using kind of the same technique that I came up that day. Now, a little bit of disclaimer. If you guys saw uh, Jeremy Cox yesterday, he did something similar. He did like a miniature character. And I was just sitting there and kind of freaking out a little bit. But then I started seeing like the bright side of it. And I thought to myself, if you guys like my accent, you should just watch my presentation. But if you don't, then just watch his presentation because we're doing kind of the same thing. But to be serious, our techniques are going to be a little bit different and he talked more about like how he rendered and his character was more like static. So I'm going to show you how we build those characters and then we're going to rig them, also have controllers and how we can use some presets from Mixima. Plus I'm going to use body paint to kind of texture it and he used Substance Painter. Now if you watch both presentation, I think that you're going to get like a very good foundation from this so you will be ready to build those characters. So now I'm going to start talking and just dive in and see how we can build those. All right, so I'm going to go on Cinema 4D. And the base character that I used was something from um, Content Browser. And I don't know how many of you know, but Cinema 4D comes with a lot of uh, free models and presets. So 
every time you need a free model, just go on Content Browser, you will find it there. So basically this is the character that I used and uh, there are two different reasons why I decided to go with this character. First, he, he doesn't look like a realistic human, so he, he's already like a toy. And the second was that time, I thought that I'm not gonna have time to rig it. And these guys are really easily, like um, you can pose them basically because they're almost rigged. Like you can just remove the arm and you can see everything is like having joints basically. So now what I'm gonna do is um, just middle click here. And by doing that, basically I'm gonna select everything on this hierarchy and I'm gonna go to coordinates and I'm just gonna reset the rotation and by doing that, we just bring this guy on a T-pose, basically. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna do is uh, remove those uh, materials, because I'm not gonna use them. And now, it's very clear that this uh, character is made from different uh, objects, like you can clearly see that. Now, our challenge will be to make this look like a one solid object. So for that, we're just gonna use the volume builder. And now if I drag this and make it as a child of it, you're gonna get this, basically a bulb of pixels. And now what is happening is that my voxels are uh, a little too big. And voxels are your 3D pixels, if you will. So if I go here and just make them like uh, very small, I usually use centimeters and this is on inches, cause still from Europe. <laughs> so let's see, something like that will do. So as you can see right now, we kind of like have this uh, as a solid object, so you don't see any disconnection on this. I'm just gonna go a little bit further, so let's just try something by 0.2. And essentially, if you decrease this size, so if you decrease the size of the voxels, your character, it, it will be more defined, so you're gonna see more quality of it. I'm just gonna go something like 0.4. All right, so now we have this character here, but still it's on a volume phase. Now, if we want to texture it and rig it and do all sorts of things, we have to turn it into a mesh. So for that, we just use the volume measure. So now just, if I just drag this guy here, you can see that 80% of the work, it's, it's done. He already looked a little bit like a, like a toy. Like you can see also that everything is connected together. Now he looked like a toy, but the problem is that he looked like a just random person. And our goal was to make them look basically like chefs. So to do that, what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna try to give him a hat, like a chef hat. So even if you don't know how to model, good thing about the voxel is that you can just use primitives and basically get the job done. So now I'm just gonna try to make this small and I'm gonna use some shortcuts, but unfortunately probably I'm not gonna have time to explain all that. So if I just bring this here. And now I'm gonna press C to make it editable just so that I can scale this, this cylinder in different directions. All right, now I'm gonna add a sphere and I'm gonna hold shift while I do that because I want my, my sphere to be a child of that cylinder. And I do that just so that I can come here and basically his shift C, this window pops up and I can be like reset PSR. And if I click that, this sphere will copy the position of the cylinder so I don't have to do the same thing over and over. Now usually what I like to do is change the type of the sphere from standard to hexahedron because it just has the better polygons. And although it doesn't matter with, um, with voxels, it's like my sec second nature to, to kind of change that. So now if I bring this guy here, probably by now you should see where I'm going with this. Something simple as that. Now I'm gonna bring this a little bit lower. And as you can see, his hair, it's intersecting a little bit with the cylinder. And if you wear, if you wear a hat, you're not gonna have that much volume on your hair. So I'm just gonna go here and kind of like scale it like down. Also, this is a little bit too much, so. Something like that. Now, if I just drag this here and turn these guys on again, you can see that already he looked like he has 
something that looks more or less like a hat. But the problem is that we can still see that we just use a simple sphere there. Now, what we're going to do from here, we're going to take this character and go basically sculpt it a little bit, just so that we give a little bit of randomness on his hat. But first, before I go there, I'm just going to make sure that the fingers here have enough geometry. So what you can do, you can just come here and I'm just going to increase the thresher basically just to make this a little bit thicker. And also I'm going to go here to the builder and make this 0 0.3 just so that the fingers are a little bit more defined. All right, so from here, I'm just going to press C to make this editable. And when we did our characters, we add more stuff. But since we're doing this live, I'm just giving, giving him a head. So from here, what you can do, you can just go to sculpting, basically. Now, here you have a lot of tools that you can sculpt your character. And the one that I'm going to use right now is the grab tool. I'm just going to try to zoom in here and try to scale down this brush a little bit. And just by doing this, basically, you give a little bit of randomness so it doesn't look like, like you use the sphere. Now, we did more than this, basically, but you get the idea. Now, to give a little bit of the folds on his head, you can use the knife tool, for example. Now, I'm going to scale down the brush again. And you can scale down the brush by just holding control. And if you middle click and move left to, to the right, you can change the size. If you want to change the sensitivity of the brush, you can go up and down. So I'm just going to keep it somewhere like this. Now, if you start like doing this, you start to give a little bit of like, um, like folds, right? And now you can clearly see that that's kind of low poly. So what you can do is just come here and increase the subdivision by clicking this button. But when you do for like just once, Nothing will change, except that Cinema 4D will apply the sculpting tag in your object. Now, if you want to increase the subdivision, you have to click it one more time. So as you can see, clearly now we have more subdivision. But uh, basically, you just go and um, give some, some folds like this with a knife tool. So just a little bit of imperfection will help sell the, the idea. Now this is taking too too long because like my again my Wacom pen is not uh, working in a proper way, and also if you have problems like this, what you can do you can just take like let's say the flat brush, and then you can go and kind of like basically almost erase them. Something like that. Now from here we need to texture this guy. So from that, I'm going to use a uh, body paint. And I know a lot of people are scared of body paint. And I see a lot of people posting things on the internet being like, oh, I just unwrapped this like with five clicks in different plugins. But honestly, you can do same thing in body paint. People are afraid of it. But if you learn, if you learn the basic of it, it's really, really powerful tool. So before we jump to body paint, one more time, I'm going to go to my standard layout. And if you see this mesh now, it's pretty tense, like it has a lot of geometry. Now, for us to rig this and to, to texture it, it's better if we have something that is more manageable, like something that is less uh, dense. So for that, we're just going to use the polygon reducer. Now, if I make this as a child of it, polygon reducer, what will do, it will take a little bit of time, but right now it's just trying to calculate your, your character and like reducing your polygons by 90% and still maintaining the same kind of shape. All right, so it's kind of hard maybe to tell, but if I just make a copy of this guy and move this side by side, you will see that this one has way less polygons. And that's manageable. We can, we can work with that character. So I'm just going to delete this guy. And now I'm going to bake this, uh, this object and delete this one too. So from here, we need to unwrap this uh, character. Now, to do like, uh, like proper unwrapping, you will have to kind of have an edge loop so you can go and uh, cut things easier. 
But since we did this a little bit like quick and dirty, you're getting all these uh, triangulated geometries. And it will be very difficult to kind of unwrap it in a proper way. But thanks to body paint, now we can just switch to body paint here. And you can see that's basically our UV. And it's all messy, right? So it's very easy actually to fix it. You just click this button over here. And if you come to projection, you can project this in different kind of ways. But if you just do box, right away you can see that we have a very good representation of our model in a 2D world, if you will, here. Like we can clearly see that uh, this is the front and this is the back of it. Now, doing this, we had a little bit of a problem because uh, we wanted to create that kind of line that those, if I go back, like those characters had, right? And we did that using the displacement map. So this side, side UV doesn't look that, that good and it will be kind of hard to kind of paint over it. So after that, what we did, we just went to optimal mapping and you just keep those settings as they are. And if I click apply, you can see that now the sides are way better than they used to be. Now we sacrificed a little bit the front and the back, but the side was very important too. So now this is by no mean like proper way of unwrapping a character, but it still gets the job done. And thanks to body paint, even with this, you can work. You can just go and paint on top of your, of your character. And this is the power of Cinema 4D because it, it allows you to do a lot of things. And as you can see, we're, we're just going from standard layout, switching to sculpting, coming to body paint. And it's almost like using different software inside one software. So we didn't have to leave uh, Cinema 4D until now. Now, to add a texture, what you do is go to materials. And I'm just going to delete these guys. And I'm going to double click here. And uh, to apply to our character, I'm just going to drag it here and apply it like that. So as you can see, our character already turned to, to kind of white color. So from here, we need to add some texture. So we go back again to materials. And uh, what we have to do is uh, click this X here. And that's basically will enable your texture. So if I do that, then we got another X here. So basically we enabled our texture, but we don't have any texture yet. So we have to create one. So to do that, you just click this X here and everything here is very self-explanatory. You just pick the, the dimension. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna multiply this by two. Oh, sorry, that was wrong. I'm just multiplying that by two and also multiplying this by two as well. Now I'm gonna click okay. So if I go to layers here, what you will see here is that you have almost like a Photoshop inside 3D. Now I'm gonna change this background because probably this will be like very hard to see on uh, internet. So I'm just gonna go and change the color of the background to something like a little bit darker just so that we see our UV a little bit better there. Now here we can create layers, like as we do in Photoshop. So I'm just adding a layers. And if I take the brush, I'm just coming here to the colors and make sure that the color is white. And now I can start paint over this uh, character, right? Now doing it this way will take a little bit of time. And since we have this uh, 2D presentation of our character, why not using it? So what we can do is come here and uh, take this uh, poly, I think polyline selection tool. And then you can uh, start basically selecting the portions that you want to be painted white. Like we're giving this guy basically some clothes. And he's a baker, so usually that's what they wear. And I don't know if you noticed, but I'm going a little bit inside of the sleeves. And I tell you why in a second. So I can clearly see that that's the neck. So I'm going inside here too. Now by just selecting this, I can um, take the bucket tool and just by one click, you kind of like paint the front and the back. Now we have to do kind of the same thing for the side. So same technique, I just go and select these. And I'm gonna hit bucket again. So now sides are done we have to do the, the sleeves as well. All right. And I can see that the other hands are here. So 
something like that. And now you can see that we missed some of the polygons. And the reason is because, again, like this is not the proper way of basically UV um, unwrap your character. But now, since it, we're in body paint, we can just take the brush and start filling out those, uh, those gaps. Now, the reason why I did go inside a little bit on the sleeves was that it will be very hard to predict where this line should be connected. So now I just go with a brush and um, paint that, that thing out. Now, again, because we have all this like wrap, unwrap a little bit like fast, we're getting that problem there. I don't know if you see, but uh, my brush is jumping from one polygon to another. Now, if you come to this problem and you want to be very, very precise with your brush, what you can do, you can just take this projection brush here and this kind of ignore all your UV and it will just like project and paint on top of your, of your model. Now, this brush is a little bit slower, but it's very precise. And after you paint the whole thing, you let it go, then Cinema 4D will calculate and just put that color into your objects. Now, doing this is not very fun and it will take a little bit of time. So I kind of texture all this thing at home just so that I don't waste time here like painting this, this guy. But I want to share two more things before I open the, the character that is already textured. Now, some of you might like to, to have this texture in Photoshop and give it more detail. So what you can do is you can just come to File here and basically you can save this texture as a PSD. Now, one thing you're going to miss on PSD is the UV map. So you're not going to see those edges there. You're just going to see those layers basically here. Now, if you want to export that as well, what you can do is make sure that your brush first is like the pixel is like one pixel. And then you pick a color that you often don't use. So let's say this color over here. And then if you select all these uh, geometries, what you can do is create a new layer here. And if you click this button over here, then basically you're going to paint all these uh, edges into a layer. So now if you export this uh, in Photoshop, if I were to just hide the UV, you're going to have that as a layer, basically. All right, so from here, I'm just going to go and open the character that I already textured. So I'm going to open this guy. That's good. Now, if I go to material, you can see that what I did, I just gave him a uh, different color for the pants, a uh, different color for the shoes. Also gave him a little bit of, uh, of hair there. But I did use the same kind of model just so that we stay true to this. So after I did the color, then I created also the displacement map. And basically what I did, I just created this line on the edges just to create that, that kind of line that those characters had on, on the side. So now I'm just going to go to a standard layout. And from here, the next challenge was to rig this guy. Now, we did all this thing without ever having to leave a Cinema 4D. But to rig this guy, what we did was uploading into Mixima. And uh, Mixima will kind of auto-rig your uh, humanoid characters. So to do that, I kind of recorded a video at home just so that we don't wait for, for the whole uh, process. So as you can see, this is the character that we have. One thing that you should make sure is to export without subdivision surface, just so that it's not uh, very heavy. So you go export that as FBX. And usually, usually I use uh, FBX uh, 7.3. It seems to work better with Mixima. So as you can see there, I pick 7.3. I make sure that uh, I have the selection only checked on because I don't want to export the cameras and the rest of my scene. And then when I export to Mixamo, I usually don't export the textures because I want to keep the texture in the same folder. So then you go to Mixamo and you just go and basically upload the same character that we did. Now, when you upload that, you can see that this is very easy to kind of like just bring those dots where they should be. So chin on his chin, the wrist on his wrist and so on and so forth. And then basically uh, Miximo is going to auto rig the whole character for you, which is uh, very, very handy. Now you can do rigging inside Cinema 4D, but this is kind of like auto rig, so why not using it? Also, I changed the skeleton to two chain fingers because if I go back, if I go back to my character there, I don't know if you remember, but we had only the thumb and the rest of the fingers were all connected together. 
So why adding more joins when you don't need them? So as you can see the representation there. So now you just press next, you wait for the computer to kind of calculate this character. And now our character is a little bit confused because uh, he just became alive. So he's looking at what's going on. Now, if you go next, you have the character, it's all rigged, it's on a T pose, you can just download it and take it from there. Now, one thing before we move into Cinema 4D again, Mixamo has a lot of presets that you can use, like a lot of cool animation. But then when you work on production, you have to know that uh, you're going to be challenged with feedbacks. And if you don't know how to fix those, um, those Mixamo animations, then you're going to be in trouble. So today I'm going to show you how to take the rig from Mixamo, build controllers inside Cinema 4D, and then use uh, presets from Mixamo, and I'll show you how you can control them. I'm just going to open that, that character that I downloaded from Mixamo. So that's from Mixamo here, and I'm going to click OK. Now, as you can see, we have our character there. He's already rigged. You can see the joints there. But one thing that you should keep in mind, every time you bring something from Mixamo, although it's not animated, it's static, always will come with keyframes. So you have to make sure to kind of like middle click this guy, just so, that, just so that you select everything from the hierarchy. And if you go to coordinates, basically you have to delete those keyframes. You can clearly see that we have those turned to red, so that means that they have keyframes. All right, so now, Animating this guy will be very, very hard because you have to go and select each joint separate and like move it like this will be like uh, very time consuming. So you need some controllers, right? So that time, um, what we did, so yeah, that time uh, Cinema for dr 21 was not released. So we use this uh, plugin here to do the controllers. So this plugin is very good, actually. You can just, uh, I'm just going to open the palette and drag those uh, controllers here. And now all I have to do is select this null over here. And if I just uh, center this to his heel, and if I click this button, look at that. Now we have total control over this character. So I can just select that, and I have IK, basically, controller on this character. And not just that, also we have extra controllers here which is pretty good. Now, again, when we did this, R21 was not released yet, but Cinema 4D now have similar tool inside R2021. Um, so if you have 21, you should have similar kind of plugin built in. All right, so now I'm just gonna, um, again, bring this guy back to a T pose. Let's say we want to use some of that Mixamo presets, right? So I downloaded one. I was a little bit surprised because they, they named it that hip hop dancing. And actually, I don't think that's a hip hop dancing. That's more like uh, how Albanians dance. Like, I'm Albanian, so this is how we dance. <laughs> this is not a hip hop dancing. Anyway, so what if we want to take this animation that we already have and apply to our character? So all we have to do now is uh, copy this. And if I go back to my uh, last scene, which is this guy here. I'm just gonna paste that, the other character that is dancing. Let me just extend this uh, timeline. Now, I'm gonna change the color of this guy just so that we kinda see what we're doing. So I'm just gonna turn him to green. All right. So now, we want to copy the animation from uh, this guy to our character. So all you have to do with this plugin is to basically select this uh, master controller. And if you click this button here, it will ask you like how much of the frames you want to bake. And this character had th around 360 frames. So I'm just going to go a little bit less just so that we do it a little bit quick. So I'm going to go from 0 to 150. And I'm going to click OK. So now, as you can see, our characters start dancing with the other character. So basically, what's happening now is just like copying the same animation from the other character to our character and actually does something even better. And I'll show you why in a second. So now we just have to give it a little bit of a time. Okay, so what happened now, so if you bring those uh, guys from Mixamo, you will see that all the keyframes are basically in the joints, right? And uh, modifying them will be super, super hard. What this plugin did is like, took those keyframes and apply in our controllers. 
So now if the client comes to us and be like, hey, that hand is similar to the other hand, so we want that to be a little bit higher. I guess I broke his hand, but uh, you can just come here and like kind of like move those around, right? Now another challenge that you're going to face with Mixamo characters is that if you go to those uh, keyframes, now let me open just that, that arm, you will see that for every frame you have a keyframe. And modifying this will be a little bit tough because you have to go basically every frame to kind of like tweak those. Now Cinema 4D has a very, very good feature that not a lot of people know about. So what you can do is like you have all these keyframes, right? And uh, you want to sim simplify them. So what you do, you just go to F curve here and you can take a screenshot of that. So you, you create a screenshot and now I'm gonna delete all the keyframes except the first ones. And now if I go to F curve, I can just bring that uh, screenshot back here and it will be kind of hard to see, but we have this kind of like representation of those keyframes here. Like, I don't know if you can see that line there. So then from here, you just go and uh, kind of like uh, do it a little bit this way. So you skip some of the keyframes. And this is a little bit of a labor work, but after you're done with that, uh, it just makes everything uh, way easier. So I'm not going to do the whole process because that, that will take a little bit of time, but you can totally use this to modify those animations and it will be easier to change them in the future. Now, I'm just going to undo those steps. Now, one thing that uh, we, were we were challenged too was that client wanted this animation to be a little bit like a, like a stop motion, right? So what you can do is just middle click again to select everything from uh, the hierarchy. And if I come here to my uh, tracks, you can see that there are a lot of keyframes. But now how we make this guy basically move more like a stop motion. So I'm just gonna fold everything here. Now what you can do is come to function here and you have this button that says delete every nth frame. So basically you can specify like saying delete every second frame. So now here, I just do that basically. And uh, I think you get the, the idea. So my next talk is going to be creating a complex looping system, stormproofing 101. Now, this is something that we did last year for Laurel, and this animation got to be shown at the Louvre Museum in uh, Paris. Now, as you might assume, our animation was not hanged alongside uh, Mona Lisa's painting, but it was in this interactive uh, kiosk inside the Louvre Museum, but still pretty cool. Now, for this one, we had reasonable deadline, but every time you work with big corporation, they always gonna have a lot of feedbacks because there they're basically too many cooks there. So you just have to be ready and like keep everything like a very, very organized. Now, these are some of the style frames that we came up for that project. And uh, I have to credit here a very talented artist, Jose Cheka. He did those uh, style frames together with our concept artist, uh, Danny Bright. And I helped a little bit on, on that too. So we did those, those style frames. And after, after the client basically approved the style frames, we had to do the animation. And I did the whole animation myself, except one last scene that got animated by uh, uh, Adam Van Dyne and uh, Alex Strimp. And one of the things that the client won was, uh, they liked the style frames, but they said the camera should be static. So this is what we came up with. Now, as you can see, this looks cool, but we did so much work into this and it was kind of hard to show that. And uh, after we delivered this to the client, we were like, yes, yeah, it's, it's cool, but like it doesn't show all that hard work that we, we did for this. So then we created another version for, for ourselves. So this other version is more like our director cut. This is the one that we did for just for ourselves. <laughs>
that was like very complex, right? And um, actually, I have a question for you guys. How many of you think that that was done using Dynamics? Anyone? Okay. What about keyframes? Yeah, that, that was actually done all using keyframes. So we did it all by hand. And um, which brings me to my next slide, which says Dynamics versus keyframes. Now, I love Dynamics. They're really, really fun. But when you build a complex scene like that, and when you know that you're going to be challenged with feedbacks, it's always better to just go and like kind of do things like by hand and keep things organized just so that you know that you can tweak them anytime. And I'm going to show you how you, how you do that. Now, I say there are uh, layers. There's a special place in hell for people that don't know, <laughs> don't name their, <laughs> their layers. And it's very true because with a scene that complex, if you don't name your layers, you're just going to get everyone in trouble. Although I animated the whole thing myself, I still had to keep everything like named and like organized because otherwise I will just go insane. Now, render passes. Now, a lot of time when we bring freelancers, sometimes they just render beauty pass. But then when the client had com have comments, it's very hard to, to, to tweak that animation. And when you have basically passes, you can always tweak things in, in the post. Actually, that thing took like, I think an hour and a half for a frame. And imagine if the client was like, oh, we just don't like this pipe. And then you had to go back and re render the, the whole thing. But if you have, uh, if you have uh, passes, then you can just basically update just one pipe instead of updating the whole thing. Now, this video is going to be kind of like uh, revealing the secret behind how we build this animation. So now, as you can see, like this, it looks very complex. And you will think, how can one person kind of like animate such a complex scene? But if you were to split it in different pipes, and if you were to toggle one pipe at a time, things get a little bit easier, right? Actually, if I were to just zoom into that uh, pipe on top there, what you will notice is that it's just one bottle going through the path and repeating itself over and over again. But then when you see all of them together, it just looks like very complex and you will think like, wow, how, how they animated such a big scene. Not all of them was that easy. One of, some of them were more complicated because they had to go from one pipe to another object and fr from that object to another pipe. So today, actually, I just took the hardest one, hardest pipe, and I'm going to break it down how we animated that. So I'm just going to go here. And actually, before I open that pipe, I'm going to go and uh, open um, the scene just so that we see how organized that, that was. So if I go here, so now if I go to layers here, you can see that each bottle and each pipe has their, their own layers. And this is basically how we kept this organized. And it was kind of easier to, to update it if we wanted to. Because then all those pipes coming there, like if you had to change something, it will be super, super hard. Now I'm just going to switch uh, off the stage here and also the lights. So as you can see, it's very complex. And uh, actually, if I go even here, what you will see that even this sorter, it's like all animated by hand and they go through the pipes. Like you, you can clearly see that the bottles are coming that way. All right, so let me just break it down how we animate the pipe number three. All right, so as you can see, I have this bottle here. And I have also uh, these two paths. So I want this bottle to go, to go through this path first, drop on that uh, object that is already spinning, and then, then from there to go to, to another pipe, another path. Also, I created three different nulls here. One I have for uh, vibration, one is for rotation, and one is for the main bottle. And I'll show you why in a second. Now what I'm going to do is right click here, and this is very old technique. You can just align to spline things. And I'm just going to bring the path here. And I like to, I will never add, add keyframes from here. I usually just keyframe things that I want to be keyframed. So I'm just going to go to position here. And if I go to frame, um, 70, I'm just going to make this go 100% there, and I'm going to add another keyframe. So basically, we set to this bottle from frame 0 to frame 70, you're just going to follow that path, right? But now the problem is that we want that bottle to spin around that thing. So what you can do is come here, 
And like on the frame 70, basically you have your last keyframes, last keyframe. So I'm gonna add another keyframe to the spline and one frame forward, I'm just gonna say to this bottle, don't follow any path. So I'm gonna clean the path there. I'm gonna add a keyframe. And also this is not necessary, but I'm gonna switch the position back to zero. And I will, what I do from here, I just drag this and put it as a, make it as a child of this uh, object that is already spinning. So now if I were to press play, you can see that our bottle will follow the path, jump into that object and it will spin with it, right? But now we have to follow another path. And also we have one, uh, one problem here. Actually, we have two problems. One, our bottle, it's kind of spinning with this thing together. Like, I can prove that to you if I just stop here and spin this guy. You can see that our bottle is spinning with that, right? Because basically our bottle is following a position, but not a rotation. So it's still like child of that uh, object. So it's, copy the, it's copying the rotation from that object. So to fix that, it's very simple. You just click this button here. But now as you can see, our bottle is trying to spin through the spline, but it's doing this weird thing and it's not landing how it should land, right? So that's why we have that rotation null here. Because right now, basically, I, I don't have any access on my rotation. So I just go to this null and just make sure that this is like back 90 degree. Now, if I press play, you can see that our bottle now is going through the path. It will fall uh, on that thing and spin with it. Now we just have to do the other, the other path. I'm just gonna try to zoom in here a little bit. And let's say from here, we want to follow the other path. So what we have to do is come here, let's say to this frame, and we have to add a keyframe to the spline path again, just so that we make sure that this bottle for this time is not following any path, right? And from here also, one frame forward, I'm just gonna bring the path too. And now, as you can see, our bottle flipped again, but we're going to fix that later. Now, I don't have to add another keyframe here because it's already on the zero. Actually, I might have to. Yes, I, I do have to add a keyframe here, sorry. And if I scrub through, I'm just going to bring this up to 100% and add another keyframe. If I press play, you can see that our bottle is going there, dropping on the other pipe, spins with it. And now that's the problem, right? It's like flipping. And if you scrub through like backwards like this, your bottle always is gonna be like kind of messy. But if you just pass that when the bottle is following the path, you'll be fine. Now from here, I'm just gonna make sure that I'm on this keyframe. Go to this rotation again. And I'm gonna bring uh, actually one frame forward. So while it was staying on that thing, I want to be exactly on 90, 90 degree. But now next one, I want that to be zero. So now if I play it one more time, this bottle will follow the path, drop on the thing, spins with it, and then follow the other path. But now again, we need our bottle to kind of match a little bit the pipe so it falls as it goes there. So it's very simple now. We can just, again, come to this uh, rotation and we can add another keyframe here, move a little bit forward and bring it back to 90 degree again and add another keyframe. Now if I press play, you can see that this bottle is following the path, going there, spins with the thing, and follow another path. Now, keyframing is not very good in this. The, anim the other animation looks way better, but we don't have time to do like a proper keyframing here. So now the vibration tag, we use that because we wanted, like as this bottle was reaching this other pipe, we wanted it to, to look like it was something was sucking that, uh, that bottle in. So if I just scrub through here. Now let's say from here, we want to see that vibration happening. So before I apply the vibration, and I'm going to add the vibration on the rotation, right? I just want to add a keyframe here, right? Just so, just so that I make sure that this bottle is not going to be rotated until here. And I'll show you why in a second. And now, here, I'm going to go to tags and add a vibration tag. Now I'm going to enable rotation, right? And I'm going to give some uh, values here. So on this point, I'm going to switch off the vibration. One frame forward, I'm going to turn it on and click OK. Like uh, add another keyframe. So now our bottle is just going to go through the path. 
drop there. And when it reaches that point, it starts to kind of wobble a little bit and then goes in inside there. Now, the reason why I did that keyframe on the rotation here is that when I go to frame zero, because this thing had to, to be looped, right? It had to always like loop. So when I go to, to frame zero, I'll make sure that my rotation here is zero, zero. And if I didn't have that, like let's say if I delete this keyframe here, and if I press play, now everything will work fine. It will go through that, it will wobble. But then when I go back, you can see that my bottle shifted a little bit, right? It has a little bit of rotation there. And you can clearly see the numbers here. So every time you use the vibrate tag, you just gotta make sure that your first point, it has to be the way you want it. So you just have to keyframe those, those things. Now, so yeah, you can go and just like uh, tweak the animation, but basically this is how, how we did that. Now, if the, let's say if the client wanted to add more, more bottles on, on this uh, pipe, right? What you can do is like, let me just fix first this rotation again. So I'm gonna go here and bring this back to zero, add a keyframe. Now let's say client want more bottles. They will be like, oh, we like this, but uh, can we add more bottles? Now it's very easy. You can, you can just duplicate, duplicate this and call it like, let's say bottle zero two. And all you have to do is select this guy here. You will show all the tracks and I'm gonna middle click just so that I select everything and bring it here again, just so that I make sure that all my keyframes are in there. And also I'm gonna drag the tags. So now if I just uh, delay these keyframes for the second bottle, you're gonna see that now we have two bottles. So using dynamics, maybe, maybe it will look more like realistic but this is a little bit better because if the clients want to tweak things, it's very easily, easily like tweakable. Like you can just go and like add more bottles or like make it slower, make it faster, anything you want. All right, so my next slide is gonna be personal projects. So if I may just give this a kind of advice, I do a lot of personal projects. I do them for exploration and self-promotion. So I know a lot of people are just like chasing likes in Instagram and I do that too. Sometimes I make those satisfying animations as well. But you have to think that when you have a free time, spend that time kind of coming up with techniques and learn some new, new stuff because that, that's gonna be more valuable for you. Now these are some of the, my favorite um, uh, personal projects that I did. And you can see each one of them has a little bit different kind of like look and different, different kind of technique. So, this is it guys, uh, this was my presentation, thank you so much, and if you want to stay in touch, uh, that's my website and you can follow me on uh, Instagram as well. All right.